Good morning, everyone. I am Jesse Wittish with Kentucky Youth Advocate. Thank you for joining us for our first post-2022 Kentucky General Assembly Advocate Virtual Forum. And uh, it is great to see all of you. Just a reminder that we're recording today's forum as both a podcast and a video. So we ask that you stay muted, uh, but we know folks may have questions about specific bills or something like that as we go through the forum. Please drop those in the chat and our policy folks who are on the forum today will try and address those in the chat. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Terry Brooks. Hey, thanks a lot, Jesse. And uh, it's great to have uh, everybody kind of back joining us. Uh, I do want to mention, and I'm probably bearing somebody else's uh, lead or closing at the end here, but uh, I wanted to architect uh, what we're doing on session. So today is sort of a macro view from KYA staff. Uh, next week, we're hoping to have uh, majority representatives from majority Senate and House to talk about their perspective. And then uh, we're working on a couple different versions uh, to include House Democrats and, ha and Senate Democrats. And that is, we're probably gonna do a little bit more of a one-to-one -one discussion with Morgan McGarvey and Joni Jenkins, since both of them are sort of leaving, not sort of, they are leaving the General Assembly. So uh, I'm sure that uh, you will get more emails, notices, and alerts than you can shake a stick at. But I did want you to know that we're inviting you to engage today, uh, certainly engage next Wednesday, and then look for a little different uh, take on House and Senate minority view. Uh, my wife would have wonderful answers. Well, my grandkids would have wonderful answers about uh, grandma because they're going to talk about making holiday desserts and crafts and all that. I, I like I worry a little bit that in 30 years when my grandkids get asked, uh, when they think about me, their favorite memory is my debit card. So I'm just saying that's kind of the emotional ties. So anyway, uh, we want to launch into a discussion. And, uh, you know, I'm going to tell you that I hope I see Rosemary Condor on here. So I can guarantee you Rosemary fits this. Uh, several people are going to hear me deliver the same message several times because uh, I believe that uh, the perspective we're bringing on the General Assembly is really important. And I think we're going to have to repeat it several times for, uh, for it to resonate. So I just, you know, I want to tell you that uh, if you pop up on so many of our coalitions, whether that's the Blueprint or Face It or Bloom or Bounce, and just go right on down the line, uh, get ready because you're going to you're going to hear some reruns on purpose. So uh, I want to start uh, in my, my colleague Mara has already heard this uh, quote uh, in his last press conference before he got launched to the moon. Neil Armstrong was asked uh, what he hoped, uh, what answers he hoped to discover uh, as he walked on the moon. And uh, his answer was pretty profound, which is, I really hope uh, what I discover is a bunch more questions. A lot of times we leave the General Assembly with observations, reflections, and lessons learned. Uh, I leave the 2022 General Assembly with a bunch of questions. Now, you're gonna hear from uh, my very skilled and dedicated colleagues, uh, a number of really important wins. So I, I just wanna emphasize that the questions that I'm asking in no way dilute, minimize, or mitigate important legislation that uh, is gonna positively impact everything from uh, child welfare, to uh, family nutrition. Uh, and so I, I don't want to in any way uh, uh, minimize, for instance, the uh, number of pieces of legislation that were passed that directly and positively uh, address child maltreatment. And we're going to hear those good news stories. Uh, and it's important that we celebrate those. I'm sure you're going to hear from, from uh, others that not only do you need to celebrate, you need to reach out to that legislator and say, hey, I was just on a forum and heard that you did this for early childhood 
or you did that for uh, victims of domestic violence. So, you know, understand that part is coming. But I, I want to talk about uh, three or four questions. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think it's probably that uh, I'm just not smart enough to keep up with the legislators' thought processes. So uh, my first one would involve the issue of local control versus big government. Uh, for over a decade, the North Star for Republican legislators in both the House and Senate was local control. Their answer to everything was local control. Uh, what do you think we should do about masks? Local control. What do you think we should do about schools? Local control. What do you think we should do about, you want to fill in the blank? The answer was always the same. So on the multiple choice test, it was easy. B, local control. That was always the correct answer. Not this year. Not this year. As an example, in 2019, the late Bam Garney and Senator Max Wise architected the school safety and resiliency bill, landmark piece of legislation. Uh, the essential element of that bill was to say that principals and superintendents knew best what <laughs> it would take to protect their kids in school. Uh, that meant that some schools, in fact, used school resource officers and some schools didn't. Some schools implemented deeply uh, uh, broad mental and behavioral health supports. Others retrofitted how Friskies functioned, but lots of variety. That's out the door because this year, because of a piece of legislation, the General Assembly has said, whether you believe in school resource officers or whether you don't, whether a school resource officer works in your school or doesn't, you're getting one. And that's what the money is for. So when it comes to school safety, the message that Frankfurt sent this year was superintendents, principals, eh, you don't know best. Instead, Frankfurt knows best. Big brother and big government are gonna tell you what to do. The other example I would give you, and we just had an off camera discussion about this uh, because there's an article in the Courier Journal today detailing lobbying expenditures. Uh, another bill that was advanced by, uh, and again, just because we want to do shout outs and also honest critiques, the, uh, the school resource bill that I was mentioning is sponsored by Kevin Bratcher, uh, and uh, as in a bad piece of legislation. Uh, a contrast to that is Senator Will Schroeder sponsored a, a terrific piece of legislation. Essentially, it gave local communities the option I'm looking at Alicia and Mahek. If I get this wrong, they'll tell me. But uh, essentially, what it did was give local communities an opportunity to regulate advertising and promotion of products that were injurious to kids. So we know that it's not an accident that uh, e-products uh, tend to get marketed as cherry slush or unicorn confetti, et cetera. Uh, I'm sure that'll shock you, but they're not advertising e-cigs as cherry slush for me. They are for my grandson. And what this legislation did, it didn't mandate anything. It did not mandate a single thing. But it did say that if your community wanted to protect kids in a more rigorous and creative manner, they could do it. Local control, right? Did not happen. The CJ's article today, if you read between the lines, may give us the reason why, because the Retail Federation and big tobacco interests spent uh, $180,776 to defeat that bill from January through March. That doesn't count April, so we probably can get over that $200,000 mark. And so again, the message from Frankfurt, because they did not move on that bill, so the school resource officer bill was taking control away from local schools. That passed. The tobacco bill would have given authority to local communities. That didn't pass. So here's my question. Is this an aberration 
is this a one-off? Is this a one year we're going to be the party of big government for Republicans? Or is it a seminal shift? So that's the first question. The second big question that I have uh, leaving the session is the role of national groups driven by ideology and their impact on Kentucky policy. For a long time, Kentucky lawmakers on the left and on the right needed to be commended because they pushed back against national agendas. Uh, this year, we saw some interesting dynamics. Uh, for instance, H House Bill 7, which we know was a uh, fundamental attack on public benefits. Uh, let's just be very clear. Uh, the thinking on that bill does not originate in Frankfurt. It originates from an ideological group in Florida. And uh, if you go to that group's website, they have a map of the United States. They tell you what they're doing in each state. And if you dig a little bit deeper, you find they have the same strategy in every state. Let's spend a lot of money to hire high profile uh, lobbyists. In Democratic states, they're hiring lobbyists who contribute to the Democratic Party. In Kentucky, they're hiring lobbyists who contribute a lot to the Republican Party. And uh, we're going to work this so that we can curtail public benefits in Kansas and Connecticut and Kentucky in the same way. Really form shop uh, a rubric to do that. Now, when that bill started, the contents of the bill uh, should have scared us all. Uh, you're going to hear, I assume, more about that in terms of details at the end of this. I, I do want to tell you that, uh, and they've gotten, I don't think they've gotten the recognition, frankly, they need, and some of you will not agree with that. But uh, Speaker Osborne and Representative David Mead actually did listen to some of y'all and us and other partners and made significant changes to that bill. Uh, we still have concerns about unintended consequences. We still have some unanswered concerns, but the guts of the bill shifted. And what I can tell you is that they got significant political pressure, significant political pressure from this group in Florida and from that Florida group's agents in Kentucky to stick with the program. So uh, that's important to know the, the pressure that lawmakers get from well-heeled, well-connected national groups. Another example, and uh, fortunately this did not happen, Senate Bill 40, which uh, has uh, a, a misnomer title, per the Parental Rights Bill, it's really uh, an anti-kid bill. Uh, it would have mitigated uh, uh, lots of the reforms of child welfare. Uh, clearly, clearly uh, intended to also attack the landscape uh, around the fairness agenda for young people. Uh, that bill emanates directly from a, a, a group in Colorado. Uh, identical legislation was filed in 44 states. So you either believe in spontaneous intellectual combustion in Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Massachusetts, and Frankfurt, that all these legislators spontaneously had the same idea, wrote the same proposals, used the same words, or you believe that national group is form shopping a national solution for Kentucky issues. Uh, I'm just saying I'm voting for the second one. Uh, again, that particular legislation to the credit of House leadership, uh, did not see the light of day. It did pass the Senate, but it did not see the light of day in House. So it meant that the House, again, stood up to an ideological national group trying to tell Kentucky what Kentuckians should do. If the first one around local control versus big government, we're, we're gonna see where that goes in subsequent sessions. The second point, I'm just telling you up front, and we could cite a number of other examples. 
if anybody thinks those national groups are going to go away, if, if anybody thinks that those national groups are going to say, dang, we lost in Kentucky. I guess we'll just give up on that. Well, you're kidding yourself. So we better look at what pieces of legislation were brought by those extremist national groups to Kentucky. And we better be preparing now to get ready for 2023 because they're not going away. The third question I have is what happened to the good and thoughtful work of the Commission on Race? Uh, Mahek and Courtney Downs, who's on screen, or at least her name's on screen, uh, and I uh, had the chance to be at that group's last meeting. I think it was the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. And uh, Senator Givens and Representative Heverin co-chaired the group. They had spent months in a very artful way thinking about issues of equity, uh, frankly, by both race and zip code uh, within that commission. Uh, and they had invited views and conversations that were divergent, that frankly made some of the members of the commission uncomfortable, but they had done a very honorable job, a very honorable job of trying to dig in to the systemic and historic disproportionality and disparities that mark the Commonwealth. And they left that Tuesday before Thanksgiving meeting with a discrete set of policy recommendations. Uh, these were very pragmatic, these were very commonsensical. Uh, they, they were not uh, going to be divisive ideas. Uh, I was so wrong that I left that meeting. And my only, I wonder, issue was, are they going to package this as an omnibus bill? Is it going to be a, a commission on race omnibus bill? Or are they going to give three of these ideas to Representative Heverin, and she's going to work it in the House? And these three are going to go to Senator Givens, and he's going to work it in the Senate. I mean, that's, that was my only question, is how are they going to vote yes on these? Well, somewhere between that Tuesday before Thanksgiving and that opening gavel, they all went missing in action. You all may remember remember the Where's Waldo uh, deal. Uh, we, could, we could play Where's Waldo with these policy ideas because nobody can find them anywhere. And uh, so again, my question, <clears throat> if the first one is, are the supermajority Republicans in the Senate and the House, are they still local control or have they become big government? If the second question is, can Kentucky lawmakers continue to fight back against national ideological positions? The third one is, <clears throat> is the race commission reality or rhetoric? Uh, how can we make sure that that commission, which has good, thoughtful people, both from the General Assembly and from the community, I, I detected nothing but sincerity on their part. How do we make sure their work bears fruit? Because I don't know about you, uh, us meeting on a monthly basis talking about disparities and then it doesn't bear fruit. That's uh, disingenuous and uh, at a certain level unethical. So uh, the third question I have is, uh, can the commission on race become an actual lever for real policies to address systemic racism in Kentucky? Or is it just a show horse? So, Again, you're going to hear in a minute lots of good efforts, and I, I want to make sure you, you listen to those because I do not want you to leave this session feeling like all we're doing is saying what didn't happen, okay? But I feel like that all of us, that includes each of you, I, I want you to think hard. Uh, you don't have to agree, but I want you to think hard about the questions that I raised because again, until we get the answers, 
we have to assume 2023 is going to look a whole lot like 2022. So those are the questions we left the General Assembly with. And now my colleagues are going to talk about the answers we actually got. So, Mahek, I'll kick it to you. Thanks, Terry. Um, so as Terry alluded to, the final gavel has fallen for the 2022 General Assembly. And this year, the governor and the Kentucky General Assembly were tasked with crafting a two-year state budget, ad address redistricting, advance policies to address COVID-19 pandemic, tax reform, and other policy priorities that would be good for the communities that they represent and the Commonwealth. So if we take a second to reflect, um, that's a heavy lift for a 60-day session. But as Terry alluded to as well, there's a lot of good news um, for kids this legislative session, including in the state budget. So please note that this list that I'm about to mention does not include all policies passed, but a high level review of the blueprint policies that we've been talking about this session. So if we move on to the next slide. Um, the General Assembly has once again demonstrated their commitment to the state's most vulnerable residents by supporting legislation that builds a stronger path towards healing for those who've been affected by child abuse and neglect. And one measure in particular is Senate Bill 8, which establishes a new membership of the State Child Abuse and Neglect Prevention Board. It also expands the definition of fictive kin. Um, it expands Medicaid reimbursement eligibility for professionals who provide services at child advocacy centers and much more. And this bill was championed by Senator Julie Rocky Adams. Additionally, Senate Bill 97 passed, which provides clarifications for coroners to immediately notify law enforcement, the Department of Community-Based Services, and local health departments upon the death of a child and also strengthens the process of when a child um, fatality and near fatality occurs. Um, this piece of legislation was led by Senator Danny Carroll. And also, um, as Terry mentioned earlier, to build upon the work from the School Safety and Resiliency Act, Senate Bill 102 passed, which requires schools to provide a yearly census of school-based mental health providers to determine if the ratios of providers to students is meeting the mark. And this is led by Senator Wise. And as we all mentioned from time and time um, throughout this year th and throughout the pandemic, we have continuously left, lifted up ways to ensure children know where their next meal will be coming from. And Senate Bill 151 permits administrators of a school to authorize up to 15 minutes of a student's day to include the opportunity for children to eat breakfast during instructional time. And this, um, it, this bill, Senate Bill 151, is sponsored by Senator Jason Howell. Additionally, um, through the American Rescue Plan, um, states had the opportunity to extend Medicaid eligibility up for new mothers up to 12 months postpartum so they could have continuous, uninterrupted access to health care. Our, our legislature took up the opportunity by passing Senate Bill 178, through um, a favor which is a favorable bill favorable bill sponsored by Senator Julie Rocky Adams. Um, and what happened was that actually um, they took language from House Bill 174, which was championed by Representative Cantrell and Mosier, and included it into Senate Bill 178. And another topic that we've been discussing throughout the pandemic is families and businesses alike know the rippling effects of unstable child care the unstable child care sector. Um, especially the decision to stay in the workforce or staying home to care for children. And so a frame, a partnership framework, which, which was enacted by House Bill 499, will extend small and medium-sized businesses the opportunity to offer child care benefits in a meaningful and realistic way, while also safeguarding stability for child care centers. And that was, hap um, that was done um, by Representative Heverin's leadership alongside many co-sponsors of House Bill 499. And I'll also talk about a budget commitment um, for that bill here in a second. And so, as I mentioned, the budget is one priority that the legislature had to tackle this session. Um, a moment when true priorities of a General Assembly comes to light is when the final budget is crafted for the next two years. We know it's full of compromises, tough cuts, and bold investments. And House Bill 
one um, is the two-year state budget. And among other things, it will impact child health coverage, education, safety, and more. So if we wanna look through the education section, um, what it's accomplished is it's fully funded children, uh, full day kindergarten to boost our youngest students' academic achievement. It also increased per pupil um, seek funding. It's the same supports for school-based health services. Additionally, it increased funds for school-based services program. Um, it also increased funding for Friskies, which are the family resource and youth centers. And then in the health section, it sustained Medicaid and K-CHIP funding so children and their families can continue assessing necessary, um, um, I should say accessing necessary healthcare services. Additionally, um, it established a bridge health insurance programs so Kentuckians can continue accessing um, needed healthcare services, um, as well as allocated funds for a new suicide prevention hotline, which is 988. So if we go into the child welfare section, we saw an increased investment in the DCPS workforce, also funds to create a creative proposal that would allow workers respite from the front lines. It also sustained fund, uh, funding for the HANS in-home visiting program. It allocated funding to support a team of child abuse pediatricians and, um, and their work really to treat children experiencing abuse and neglect. Additionally, it allocated funding for independent living supports for young, um, young people aging out of foster care. And if we move on to the economic security section, um, the General Assembly prioritized child care sector by securing a $2 per day child um, child care provider reimbursement rate, as well as establishing funds for the employee child care assistant partnership um, that I mentioned earlier, which was within House Bill 499. Also, they allocated federal funding to support the emergency rental assistance program. And lastly, it increased funding for domestic violence sh shelters, rape crisis centers, child advocacy centers, all which provide vital services for survivors of abuse. So as I mentioned, there's a lot that happened and I know I just spit out a lot of information. Um, I know in the chat, we have a recap blog for you to check out um, and you could actually use that recap blog uh, to reach out to your legislators and thank them for the work that they've done this session. And although I mentioned many positive measures that passed this session, there are missed policies and budget items that would help families and kids. So um, I wanted to mention that we played more defensive work than we anticipated this session. So I'm gonna turn it over to my KYA policy team members to dive into other positive bills that passed, missed opportunities and defensive work that we tackled this session. Alicia, you could take it away from now. Thanks, Mac. Um, so I'm Alicia Watley with KYA and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the health sector, um, some missed opportunities, and also a couple of positive bills that were not on our blueprint, but that we uh, definitely were supportive of and, and tracked throughout the session. So um, the first one you definitely heard about from Terry, um, he was absolutely right on the mark with what he said this would do. Um, you know, Senate Bill 166 uh, was sponsored by Senator Will Schroeder, and it really was just aimed at allowing for that local control for cities and counties to regulate sale, marketing, distribution of tobacco products. And that does include those e-cigarettes that we know are being targeted towards youth. Um, and so unfortunately we did not see this make it through this session. Um, I think we saw more momentum early on in the session. And once this was filed, it was um, quickly assigned to the Senate um, Health and Welfare Committee. And I think that as Terry said, we really saw efforts from lobbyists, um, from Big Tobacco and the Retail Federation just, just step up their game and really just put a lot of effort into fighting against this bill at that time. So unfortunately, it did not receive a hearing um, because of, of a lot of those issues that we saw just kind of overshadowing what we were trying to work on with, with, um, with the money that they were putting towards that. So that was certainly a missed opportunity. And I think in the same realm of just tobacco prevention, we saw within the budget um, another missed opportunity to really um, prevent tobacco use among youth, uh, former foster youth and pregnant women. Um, and this would have been by investing more dollars in our tobacco prevention and cessation programming around the state, which our health departments um, provide. 
when they have money to do so. Um, we have seen cuts to this funding for several uh, budget cycles now. And so unfortunately we have very, very few departments that are actually able to provide um, prevention cessation programming around the state. And so we would have really liked to have seen an increase in that funding to really help some of these populations um, not start using to begin with. And if they are using, how do they quit for their, to, you know, for their own health? So that was certainly a missed opportunity within the budget. Um, one thing I do want to mention really while I'm talking about tobacco prevention is that we did see towards the end of session, a little bit of momentum building for another option, um, which would be statewide tobacco retail licensing. Um, and this is something that certainly was not filed this session, but we did hear some conversations happening um, towards the end of the session around this. And right now in the state, um, if you wanna to sell tobacco in a retail setting, there is not um, a licensing process to do that. And so um, this would be an effort to really establish something that's statewide to kind of oversee that the, the retail of tobacco products, making sure that they're not selling to um, anybody under the age of 21, which is the current legal age and also just making sure they're complying with any retail um, regulations around selling tobacco products. And so we wanna make sure that they're staying out of the hands of our youth. So that's one option to do that. And we're really hoping to um, kind of see some more conversation and work around that in the interim and hopefully going into next session as well. Um, so you'll see here on your, on your screen that um, I'm sure you will have heard about this effort in past years. It was filed in two different bills this year, um, Senate Bill 137 and House Bill 12. And this is really um, banning the practice of conversion therapy. And so, of course, this is an effort to protect the mental health and well-being of our LGBTQ youth. Um, we did not see a lot of uh, traction going with this effort this year. And this is another case where another narrative really just overshadowed this topic. And so in Frankfurt this year, we saw so much rhetoric around the the trans women in sports bill. Um, and I'm sure you all probably have heard about that and, and seen a lot of things happening around that. So unfortunately that kind of was what we heard anytime that there was any mention of the LGBTQ youth population. And it really overtook all of our conversations and that opportunity for us to have um, those targeted meetings and conversations around banning conversion therapy. So unfortunately we're gonna see that as a missed opportunity as well. Um, a couple of items in the budget here that we were hoping to see some investments in. I already mentioned the tobacco prevention and cessation funding. Um, another one is just adding some more. You saw that Medicaid was funded, which is great in the K-CHIP program. Um, but we do we were advocating for some additional dollars to really help with um, the, the insurance enrollment efforts. So we want to make sure that all kids in the state are covered by insurance. We want to make sure they're able to access what they need as far as health care goes. So um, you might remember that in our Kids Count book for the last couple of years, we've seen a gap in coverage among Latinx children. And so um, we want to see enrollment efforts across the board, but certainly some dedicated dollars to help close that gap, which were not included in the budget this year. Um, and the last one you'll see here is really just an opportunity that we could have had to boost the um, mental health services that are being provided in schools by sending some more dollars to school districts so that they could attract and also sustain um, enough qualified mental health service providers in the schools to, like Mahek said, meet ratios, um, and also making sure that we're taking care of all the mental health needs of our students across the state. Um, so then, in addition to these missed opportunities, we definitely want to lift up a couple of um, items that we, like I said, we're tracking throughout the session. These were not on the blueprint, but we were definitely supportive of these efforts, and we were excited to see them pass. Um, this first one is House Bill 525. And this is an effort that has been talked about for many, many years, <laughs> and we were really excited to see some momentum um, around this this year, and it actually did pass. So this is um, adding certified community health workers as a billable Medicaid service. Um, and so what this bill does is it really lays out what is the criteria to become a certified community health worker? How do you maintain your certification? Things like that. Um, it also talks about where CHWs can practice and what type of services they can provide. Um, and we know that this is a great way to expand health services in our communities and really provide additional support um, to patients in various settings. Um, they can practice in places like hospitals, health departments, rural health clinics, um, behavioral health centers, and also drug and alcohol treatment centers, and many more. So there's a lot of different ways that we can utilize community health workers to really support Kentuckians' health. Um, 
So great news that it passed. We're very excited to see that, but we know that there's a little bit more work to be done now that this bill has passed. So we're, we're now kind of turning our attention to the Department for Medicaid Services to really ensure the implementation of this legislation within the state. So we look forward to working with them and the ways in which this bill can really expand health access for all Kentuckians. Um, and the last one here is House Bill 44, which if you go and look at this bill, you will see it was changed a few times and it did have some provisions that were added during the veto period. So it went through a free conference committee, um, but ultimately it was passed. And um, among some other items that were in this bill, we were really excited and, and happy to support um, the requirement that was added for local school districts to um, amend their attendance policy to include provisions for students' mental and behavioral health status. So this is essentially saying just how students can take a sick day when they need it, they can take a mental health day. And then that is kind of covered under that as well. So this is a great way to support students. This is a great way to encourage students to be thinking about their mental health and caring for their mental health um, and really just being the best that they can be um, when they step into that classroom and making sure that they're in a place to be able to learn. So we were very excited to see that. Um, these are just some positives that we wanted to highlight as well as those missed opportunities that I mentioned. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Courtney to talk about child welfare and justice. All right, thank you, Alicia. Um, so I'll start by just talking about a few um, missed opportunities that we saw within the child welfare and justice sectors. Um, I do also wanna say that I think it is encouraging that all of these bills were at least filed. Um, some of them were assigned to a committee and one of them did move. So there has been some really good progress that I think we can continue to build on in the interim. So the first one is Senate Bill 296, and this was uh, sponsored by Senator Julie Rocky Adams. And um, this bill would have just expanded judges' discretion to create alternative community-based sentencing plans or probation um, for people who have committed nonviolent offenses and who are primary caregivers to dependent children. And this is a, a bill that's pretty critical um, as Kentucky continues to have one of the highest rates of parental incarceration in the nation. Um, the next one is House Bill 571, and Representatives Nemus and Mosier co-sponsored this bill um, that would have established 12 as the minimum age that a child could be prosecuted for most crimes in Kentucky. Um, and so even though this bill wasn't actually heard in committee, they've already agreed to convene a group of stakeholders in the interim um, who can help to strengthen the bill language and then refile it in 2023. The next one is Senate Bill 297, and this was also sponsored by Senator Julie Rocky Adams. Um, this one was filed and it was assigned to the Senate Health and Welfare Committee, and it would have just closed some of the lingering loopholes in how dependency, abuse, and neglect cases are reported and who they need to be reported to. Um, there are, you know, as you've heard uh, Mahak and Terry mention earlier, there are a number of really important child welfare bills and budget investments that made it to the governor's desk. So we're hopeful that this bill will gain some more traction in 2023. And finally was um, House Bill 83, and that was sponsored by Representative Cole Carney and Representative Heverin. And it was a bill that would ensure that victims of domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and sexual assault have access to unemployment benefits if their reason for not working is directly tied to the abuse, the assault or stalking. And you know, when we look at the child maltreatment cases that are substantiated, about half of those have domestic violence as a risk factor. So removing even one barrier to someone fleeing a violent relationship or a potentially violent situation is critical. Um, I do wanna point out that this bill wasn't even heard in committee last year. This year it was voted out of the house. So next year, hopefully we can help get it through the Senate. Um, next, I wanna just lift up a couple of positive bills that were sent to the governor's desk. The first one I wanna talk about is Senate Bill 271. This is Senator Westerfield's bill that will among other things require uniform data collection for instances of domestic violence, dating violence, and also domestic homicides. Um, this is something that is really long overdue and will go a long way in helping us to really understand how widespread this problem is in the state um, and uh, allowing advocates to more appropriately respond, raise awareness, and also promote effective um, prevention strategies. And then the other one is House Bill 263. That one is Cami's law. 
And that one will enhance the penalty for all abuse cases where the victim is under the age of 12 from a class D to a class C felony. So as exciting as it was to see so many good bills that were being filed and signed into law, we also had to play a lot of defense, as Mahek talked about earlier, on bills that could be harmful to kids and to families. Um, so the first two that I'm going to talk about are ones that um, Terry already kind of jumped into a little bit. So one of those bills is um, Senate Bill 40, which on its surface would have kind of doubled down on the rights of biological parents and interests of biological parents' rights that they already have, kind of by including them in statute. So while this can sound um, harmless on the surface, nothing in this bill really accounted for the gray area that exists for thousands of kinship and fictive kin caregivers across the Commonwealth um, who have taken children in who would have otherwise been placed in state's custody. Um, so this bill could have very negatively impacted them. Um, another bill that Terry talked about is House Bill 63, which would have required a school resource officer in every school. Um, the General Assembly, as he said, has a very long documented, well-documented history of advocating for local control, especially over school-based issues. So passing this was a clear shift in um, their governing philosophy. And then finally, there was House Bill 318, which was promoted as being a solution to the rise in juvenile involved violent crime um, and also a way to get young people who were at higher, highest risk or had the highest need for support to get them connected to appropriate community based resources as soon as possible. Um, unfortunately, nothing in this bill, as it was currently written, would have addressed either of those issues. Instead, this bill would have rolled back years of successful reforms that were implemented when Senate Bill 200 passed in 2014. Um, and it would have made it a lot easier for kids to get and stay involved with the juvenile justice system, which we all know is already incredibly easy to get to, um, get into, and then really tough to get out of. Um, and there were pieces of the bill that would have created harmful long-term consequences for young people who maybe made one mistake in childhood. Um, so it's really important, I think, for us um, to acknowledge that you know, violent crime is an issue that needs to be addressed and we are fully committed to working with legislators um, and other stakeholders to identify and implement evidence-based solutions so that we can not only respond or intervene appropriately, but also prevent more violent crime from continuing. And with that, I will hand it over to Corinna. Thanks, Courtney. Um, like Courtney said, my name is Brenna Cash, and I'm a policy analyst here at Kentucky's Advocates. I'm going to be talking through the bright spots, the not so bright spots, and some of the spots we missed in terms of economic security and education policy this session. Um, starting with the missed opportunities, a major theme of this legislative session was tax reform, and the legislature ultimately did pass a pretty significant tax reform package. Um, through this package, we had a real opportunity to implement tax credits that would have helped lift, that would have lifted Kentucky kids and families out of poverty, such as a state earned income tax credit and a state child tax credit. Um, we also had the opportunity to implement credits that would have promoted stability for children and family, such as the affordable housing tax credit that Representative Bridges and Bant introduced that would have helped increase our supply of affordable housing. So while we had these real opportunities to establish tax credits that would have promoted stability and alleviated poverty for kids and families, um, none of these really powerful and effective credits ultimately made it into the final package. Another missed opportunity was in terms of child care. Um, the child care sector in Kentucky has been in crisis for years, and this crisis was only made worse by COVID-19. Um, Senator Carroll's Senate Concurrent Resolution 142 would have created an interim joint task force to study Kentucky's birth through five system, um, including childcare and preschool. Uh, and this task force would have helped inform much needed legislative reform in the birth through five sector for next session, um, as well as help us establish where childcare goes once American Rescue Plan funds end. Um, while there are some missed opportunities in the birth through five sphere, we also saw pretty significant investments in, reform, in reforms around early literacy specifically K through three. Um, Senate Bill 9 made a number of reforms aimed at increasing early literacy, as well as increasing the number of resources available to teachers and school districts um, to help them promote early literacy. Some highlights of the bill include establishing a read to succeed intervention program, 
Um, Rita Succeed is a multi-tiered early literacy support program based out of Mississippi. Um, and Mississippi has seen some pretty significant gains in early literacy since this uh, program was introduced. Um, it aims to catch students um, as soon as possible whenever they're falling behind on reading and literacy to where they don't need those intensive interventions that other programs provide. Um, and yeah, um, the bill also does a couple of other things in addition to this free to succeed intervention program, such as permitting local school districts to adopt common comprehensive reading programs for K through three um, and establishing a number of requirements for teachers to ensure they have the resources um, and skills necessary to promote and teach uh, reading. Um, some of these requirements include requiring teachers to take courses and be evaluated on um, reading teacher prep, as well as requiring K through three teachers to be trained in reading diagnostic assessments. Um, I wanna shout out Senator West for this bill, but also uh, Representative Tipton who had a companion bill in the house, HB 226. Uh, I know he's been working on this bill and this program for the past couple of sessions and has made and made a really, really great product in the end. Um, finally, moving on to defense bills, um, as Terry said, we saw significant legislation around Kentucky's social safety net and public benefit system this session. House Bill 7 was an omnibus piece of legislation that aimed to reform public benefits. And like most ominous pieces of legislation, was a mixed bag. Um, there are some really great elements to the bill, such as allowing Medicaid to be used to provide substance use disorder treatment for incarcerated individuals, um, creating a SNAP online or an online SNAP employment and training program. Um, the SNAP employment and training program is currently extremely limited. There's not nearly enough spots for the number of SNAP recipients in the state. So this will help increase access to that program. Um, it also establishes a SNAP transitional benefit, and a SNAP transitional benefit is for folks transitioning off KTAP. Um, it allows them to receive the same level of SNAP benefits for the first couple of months they're off KTAP to help them really readjust their budget and get used to life off KTAP. Um, finally, it created a benefits cliff task force and uh, created a benefits cliff calculator for recipients. Um, this task force will do a number of different things, including studying. Um, the feasibility of continuing the increase in eligibility for the child care assistance program. Thanks to American Rescue Plan funds, Kentucky has been able to increase eligibility for that child care program uh, to 200% of the federal poverty line. And we really hope that the task force will look at this program and continue that increase in eligibility. Um, so while there are some good elements to this bill, there's also some truly problematic elements to HB7, including, but not limited to, um, the bill lacks a fiscal note. Um, so we're not sure how much implementation will cause the cabinet. Um, we're especially worried about the cost of the cabinet creating a community engagement program for Medicaid, knowing that we will not receive any federal support or funding to establish and run that program. Um, as many of you probably know, the cabinet has been experiencing a workforce crisis and really long wait times for a while now. And we're worried that some of the provisions in HB7 will worsen that. Additionally, the bill establishes new rules limiting the use of self-attestation for Medicaid. Uh, and we're concerned could result in delayed access for care. Uh, we're particularly worried for kids who are on K-CHIP but not on SNAP as self-attestation um, is a huge asset for them getting access in a timely manner. Um, finally, we remain concerned about the impacts this bill will have on former foster youth. We know former foster youth are very, are particularly vulnerable. They have high rates of unemployment and low rates of public assistance use. Um, and with no carve out for these youth in this bill, we're concerned that they will fall through the cracks. Um, one thing that I do wanna note on House Bill 7, like Terry said, Speaker Osborne and Representative Meade did listen a lot and the bill is radically different from when it started. Um, a lot of the unintended consequences that we worried about whenever the bill uh, was first introduced have been alleviated or addressed. Um, so I wanna give a huge shout out to them for listening to stakeholder feedback and really working to make a bill that has as few unintended consequences as possible. Um, another, Bill I want to talk about on HB7 was Senate Joint Resolution 150. 
Um, Senate Joint Resolution 150 effectively ended Kentucky State of Emergency and thus ended max allotments for the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP. Um, maximum allotments have allowed SNAP recipients to receive the maximum amount of SNAP benefits possible throughout the pandemic, providing crucial support for low-income families and grocers. Um, so with Senate Joint Resolution 150 passing April this month is the last month of maximum allotments, and in May we'll see about a $50 million reduction in SNAP benefits flowing into Kentucky. Um, and one other thing I would note is that HB7 is a massive piece of legislation, and this is just a quick overview. We do have a full analysis in our blog, and I believe Mara put that in the chat. If not, it's on our blog. And with that, I will turn it over to Mahat. Thanks, team, and thank you, Corinna. Um, so I just wanted to take a second to say two types of leaders make these wins possible. Um, one are legislative champions. And just as importantly, are the advocates and or organizations that have worked so hard on behalf of kids and families this legislative session. So advocates, thank you for your emails or phone calls to legislators, the social media posts, the legislative visits, um, attendance at Children's Advocacy Week, and so much more that you have done. Your efforts were critical during this legislative session, and we couldn't have done it without you. And as we look ahead to possibilities in 2023, we at Kentucky Youth Advocates are optimistic that the when the legislature resumes next year, that legislators will again make sure that kids and families are on the top of their priorities list. So with that, I'm actually going to turn it to um, Melissa to kind of wrap us up and tell us what our next steps are. All right. Thanks, Mehek, and thank you all. As always, we want to thank um, Aetna Better Health of Kentucky for their support of today's forum. And today, we heard a lot of great information from our policy experts about how this past session went. Of course, like Mehek said, we couldn't have done this session without all of you all, our wonderful advocates. But as a reminder, we'd like to encourage each of you to take part in our thank you action alert to leave a message for your senators and representatives, thanking them for the supporting those blueprint policies that Mehet covered today that passed and for prioritizing kids in the final state of the budget. So as always, the follow-up email will include a recording of today's forum, links we discussed. And as Terry mentioned at the beginning of this forum, be sure to tune in again next week for part two of this forum series, as we're gonna hear from legislators about their reflections from this past session. So it should be a great discussion and we're excited. So with that, thank you all so much for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day and we hope to see you next week. Thanks so much.